morning, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, I'm just going to move this chair out of the way so I don't keep tripping over it. Uh, okay, so if we get started, my name's Ruth Cheesley. I run a comp uh, group of companies in the UK, Viria Technologies, Viria Software, and Microdata for Joomla, which is our new baby. Uh, I'm going to be talking for about 40 minutes or so about microdata, semantic HTML, authorship, and how you can use that to develop your brand, uh, to develop your reputation, but also how you can use that to help your clients develop their brand and their reputation and improve how things look in search engines. So if anybody has any questions, if you can hold them to the end, because I quite often get asked questions that I'm going to answer in the presentation. So maybe write them down in case you forget. Uh, so, why should you pay attention to this talk rather than fall asleep after too many beers in the bar last night? Uh, I really believe that this is the way that search engines are going. Uh, every week I'm finding new things that are being done which are using microdata, that are using semantic information to improve the relevance of the information that is returned to you in a search engine. And we're the people who are putting the websites together so we're the people that can add this into our websites to make that happen for our clients and obviously to make this happen for you as well. Okay, before we talk in any depth, I'll tell you a little bit about who I am and why I'm interested in this and why I'm talking about it at a Joomla conference. Um, I came across this by accident, really. I'm, one of these, I'm not an SEO guru, just to get that out of the way. I'm not an SEO guru. I, um, but I like, I'm, I'm a bit of a geek, so if I see something new or something I haven't seen before, I do like to know how it happens. Um, and I started to see a lot of people talking about Google Plus and how it was really, really important that you do this if you're interested in search engine optimization. And I thought, oh God, not another network, another thing that I need to be involved in. Um, and then I, so I just kept listening. I didn't really do anything. I didn't really take it very seriously. And then somebody said to me, oh, if you just connect up your Google Plus profile with this, then you might see some changes happen. And I did that, and suddenly I went from like page 10 of Google. I was lit for Joomla specialist. Literally, I was like G, double O, G, L, E, and then four dots. And I was on like that page, about 20. And then I was on the first page just by making one change. And that listing on the first page was visually different to all the other listings. So it really stood out. So that's when I thought, wow, I really need to listen a bit more to what people are saying about this because it's really powerful. It's made this change with one small change from my website. So what else could it do? And that's when I started researching this a little bit more, finding out how we can use it in Joomla and realizing that actually it, it needs a little bit of technical skill, but it's actually quite easy to do. So that's how I came to find out about microdata. If you want to keep up to date with all the la latest stuff, you can follow me on Twitter, at R. Cheesley, or Google+, which is where I normally share this kind of stuff, on Google+. So if you just search for my name, you'll find me. I'm also on Facebook, but um, as some, one of my Dutch friends advised me, when you look, search me on Facebook, the translation of business person in Dutch is business man. So hopefully that doesn't confuse too many people. It is me, really. Um, so, it, so I'm there as well. So um, ultimately, at some level, we're here because of money. Either you want to make more money by doing websites or developing extensions or whatever, or your clients want to make more money, or you work for a charity that wants to make money so that they can help other people. These techniques help you to come up through the listings to, to stand out against your competitors or your, com your uh, clients' competitors. And, uh, and it really does make a big difference. If your competitors aren't using microdata and they're not using rich snippets in their search listings and you are, you've got a 30% higher click-through rate in general for your listings against your competitors. So it can actually result in real sales. And it has done for me, especially in terms of developing uh, my reputation as a person. People, you'll get sick of seeing my face, my avatar, because it's in this presentation loads. But people literally say, all routes that I search for for Joomla, you were there. Like your face was there smiling at me. And that's because I use microdata. So it's really interesting to um, see how it might be able to help you. So this is what it all comes down to. Establishing your brand, 
establishing loyalty, people recognizing you and knowing you for what you do. So you're a specialist in e-commerce for Joomla or what have you. If you use an avatar on the forums and you're replying to people and being helpful to them and answering questions, and then they see your avatar against something in a Google search listings, they'll remember that you're the person that's really helpful in the forums and they'll be more likely to view that listing because they already have seen your face somewhere than, than a random listing. So it's to do with reputation as well. That's the wrong button. So, search engine optimization and Joomla, kind of like my school reports, could do better. Yeah, it's, it's come an awful long way since Joomla 1.0. Any, any of you remember using Joomla 1.0? I mean, SEO virtually didn't feature. Um, but you do still have to use quite a lot of extensions. You do need to, if you want to get the optimum control of your SEO. Um, and the thing is, if you don't know about it, you won't do it. This stuff isn't included in the Joomla core. So by coming here and finding out about it, that's the first step. Unfortunately, people do leave my presentations and go, oh, God, I've got work to do now, because it does give you some things that you can implement on your site. So be warned, you might have some homework. So everything I'm going to tell you about in here, I've actually done. So I've had a go, implemented it on my sites, and seen a positive change. So if you want to find out about that, then come and speak to me afterwards. I've also had people who've come to these sessions at the World Conference or at Joomla Day in the Netherlands who've implemented this and have had a positive change. So it's really worth having a go. So, it all starts with the markup. Hopefully most of you will be familiar with H1, H2 and H3. And that's a way that we can organise the information on our page so that when a machine reads it, it knows that this is the main heading, this is a subheading, and this is the subheading of the subheading, and so forth. So that's a really basic form of semantic markup, giving some kind of context to the information. But when a search engine reads through these pages, that's all it knows, like this is a heading, this is a list. It doesn't know that this information is about a particular subject. It has no way of um, picking up if this is an address or this is a telephone number. It just sees the information that's there. So what, um, what Microdata allows us to do is to tell it the context. So if I was searching for Avatar, it might be my favourite film of all time that I'm looking for. It could be a Swedish melodic death metal band, which I never knew about before I started this. It could be Avatar from Ultima Online, if any of you used to play Ultima Online. It could be uh, an American animation cartoon. Or it could be that I want to know about avatars in a forum or pictures in a forum. If you don't provide any information, a search engine doesn't have any idea what type of avatar you're trying to find out about. It has to guess, in effect, which one to provide you with. So for me, people say content is king. For me, content plus context is king. The context is becoming more and more important. Anyone feel like this? <laughs> <laughs> when I first started coming across this, I was thinking, oh, God, another social network that I need to be doing things with, more stuff I need to be doing on my website, more code I need to be learning about. But this is something that really, really makes a change. It really does make a change. How many social networks are you active on that actively affect your position in a search, in a search engine? Google+, Plus, as far as I'm aware, is the only one that actively changes stuff in the search engine. So it's something that we really, really need to pay attention to. And microdata is affecting search listings. So if you have it on your website, you will start to see changes in your search listings. So that's one reason why you kind of have to get over this, oh, not another thing to do, and just kind of say, oh, well, let's have a go. So here's some rich snippets in action. I just searched for these on Google. Jim La La La, if you haven't seen that video, you really should. It's awesome. Here's a video snippet, so a thumbnail. It tells you the date it was uploaded, the duration of the, fil of the video, and who uploaded it. And then you've got the description here. And with, a th with the image, you can actually specify what thumbnail image you use. I don't know about you, but I've quite often uploaded a video on YouTube, and it's like a picture of me with my mouth open is the, th the thumbnail, and that's not really what you want to use. So using microdata 
if it's on your site, you can actually specify which image to use here. Uh, this next one is a personal profile, so that's my personal website, and you can see it's got my avatar there. It's got my name, and if you click on that in google.com, it gives you all the articles that I've written ever, anywhere on the web, because I've got the microdata in place that links it all to my Google Plus profile. And this is an indication of how many people have me in their circles. So it's an, it's an indication of reputation, in effect. Here we've got the street waffle, which obviously I have to get into these presentations. And that's a recipe, so we've got a picture of the street waffle, a rating. So it's got a rating of five, and three people have reviewed that. The time it takes to cook, so we could have cooked street waffles during the presentation. And the number of calories, which is slightly concerning. <laughs> so, so if you didn't do the performance run, maybe we should go out this afternoon. And the next one is an uh, example of events, and this one's really exciting because it, it allows you to cross-sell other related events. So using the microdata, this is the link to the main uh, Worldstar page, which is a networking event I go to, and this is telling you the next three events that are happening. So that's pretty awesome if you, if you have a site that does events. And that's all I did through using microdata. And these, if you imagine like a whole page of search listings and one with microdata, which one stands out? And if this is uh, your industry and your competitors aren't doing any microdata and then up pops one with your, micro, with your listing with microdata and whether that's stars for an e-commerce shop or stars for a review or whether it's your personal image which is more for kind of brand recognition and reputation, it makes a really big difference. And research has been done to say that these listings get a 30% higher click rate than ones without microdata. So that in itself for me is a good reason to have a play with it. And it's really simple to set up. You can test what's going on with your current sites. Um, if you Google for rich snippets testing tool, it's actually now called the structured data query tool, which is ridiculous. Rich snippets is much easier to say, but... If you search for Ritz Snippets testing tool, you can pop in the URL from your website and it will tell you what microdata is being used and it will tell you if it's linked to your Google Plus profile properly. So that's a really good way of finding out where you are now. And if you add some microdata and then you submit it again, it will show you the difference. So back in 2011, the unthinkable happened. Three search engines got together and agreed on something. And they agreed on something because they all wanted this information. They wanted this um, microdata, this semantic information about the context. But the blooming web developers, I mean, they were just chucking it at them in any way that they felt like chucking it at them. And so they couldn't, there was no structure. It was just people trying to use whatever language they felt like. So they all came together and they decided that we need to have some kind of structure to this. And that's where schema.org came about. There are other vocabularies um, like RDFA Lite and so forth. But schema.org is what Google is currently saying that it's listening for. So it's the one that I would recommend that you use at the moment. Um, on that website, if you have insomnia, it's a perfect thing to be looking at. It has uh, lists of how you can describe anything, pretty, even down to like volcanoes. Who knew that there was a schema to describe information about volcanoes, but there is. And the way it works is that everything you try to describe starts as a thing which has a name, a URL, an image, and so forth. But then each thing can be broken down into sub subtypes, in effect. So each of these subtypes has its own uh, schema, which has got information relevant to that type. So in event, you would have start date, end date, start time, end time, location, and so forth then obviously if you've got a location, you would want to be using place, which tells you address, opening hours, and so you know, parking instructions and so forth. So pretty much everything you could ever want to describe has a schema on schema.org, and it has a search system, so you can just search for like the words that you're wanting to describe. Software application, there's one for that, for example. So we start off by just saying a thing, and then this is just one example of creative work. So in creative work, which is the one we tend to use more in websites, you can describe articles, blogs, books, comments, and so forth. So you can see in there 
already that there's quite a few that we could use in websites. So if you've got um, a website that sells extensions, then you could use the software app, and that lets you say what environment it can be used in, what the requirements are, uh, a link to get the downloads, a link to the uh, technical documentation, and so forth. Um, if you've got a web page, then you can do breadcrumbs, related links, um, all kinds of other things like the headline and so forth. So there's, that's just one of the elements. This is why I say if you've got insomnia, go and read these pages because there's so much information there. So how does it actually work? It works by you adding some information into your HTML code, in effect. And what we have to do is we ha first of all have to tell it that we are adding information that is about a schema. So we're using a schema, and f we need to tell it which one. So we give it an item scope, an item type. And that's just saying, here's the URL that's got all of the information about, that I'm about to tell you. And it can then link up to that. We then tell it, this particular piece of information is this. So it might be the name, or the director of the movie, or the date of birth of the person. That's the actual property from that schema that we're explaining. And you can add these into existing markup. So you can add an item scope into a div class. You just add it on. You can add it into a span, into a P, into the body tag. So you don't necessarily have to add extra semantic stuff. You can use what's there already. So let's have some, a look at some um, examples. So this is where we are. If we were talking about our movie of Avatar or Pirates of the Caribbean, we start the um, item scope here. So we say that we're, we're giving you some semantic information, and this is the schema that we're using. So schema.org slash movie. And that schema gives you all of the information that you might want to provide about a movie. If it was a place, then we would say schema.org slash place. And you can find all of these on, on the website. We then need to say this information that I'm providing you here is actually the name of the movie. So we're using the schema of movie, and this is the name, avatar. And you'll notice that it's within the existing h1 tag. So previously, that would have just been h1. We've just added in the item prop. Then we want to do something a bit fancy, because we want to give you some information about the director of the movie. But the director of the movie is also a person. So while we want to say this is the director, we might also want to say this is their name, this is where they come from, this is their date of birth, and so forth. So you can nest another schema within a schema. So we're starting off with movie, and now we're saying in this little bit here, we're describing a person. And it works within the div. So when that div closes, you stop using the person schema and you start using the movie one again. So we've said that we're describing the director of the movie and that they're a person. The item property we're using is the name, and we're saying this is the name of the director and the name of the person. And then here we're saying the item property is the birth date of the person, and that's there. The annoying thing about schema is that you have to provide all dates in ISO format. So this would give you an error. And what we would do is we'd use some PHP code to convert that into ISO format. But I'll come to that later. But just so you're aware, there are certain elements that you have to provide in a certain format. So now we're back to the um, movie schema, because we've closed that div. And we're saying the genre of the movie is science fiction. And you can even provide a link to the trailer within the schema for movies. Um, so we've got the URL here, which is within our site. And we're saying that this is the trailer for that movie. And then we close off the div. So within that block there, it knows that we're talking about a movie. Does that make sense? Yeah? We've got another example here. I had to use Pirates of the Caribbean so that I could get a reference to Johnny Depp, so sorry. Uh, so pretty poorly marked up page here. We've only got H1. We've not got any other markup. You would, hopefully you wouldn't expect that. But you can see that if you were a machine reading through this, you don't really get any information. You're just seeing numbers and letters and words. It's not telling you anything about what that information is about. If we add microdata, and this is a pretty full-on slide, so just bear with me. I'll go through it a step at a time. So we open up the microdata 
schema for movie and we add in the name just like we did with avatar then we're saying this is a description which is the equivalent to intro text shouldn't um it shouldn't be longer than maybe one paragraph or two paragraphs. It's ideally what you would see in a Google search listing, or if you share the page on Google Plus, is what it will give us the little snippet of information. So keep it short. Then we've got we've had to add in a div here so that we can open up the schema. So we've got item pop is director, and then we're saying the schema is person, which is what we did just before. Uh, the name of the person is Rob Marshall. So that's the director, and we're also explaining that it's a person. These are the writers, so these are the authors of the movie, which is um, opened as a person schema as well, because we're talking about people. So we're saying the name of the person and the name of the author is that, and another one, and so forth. We're then saying actors, because we're using the movie schema, we've got the word actor. And it's a person, same as the director, so we open the person schema and then just provide the names of the people. You can provide all kinds of details for a person. So you, I'll let you have a look at that schema if you're interested. And then the bottom one is aggregate rating. So this is like your average rating system. So you can see how this could be used perhaps in Virtue Mart or any other shop extension where you've got ratings. Um, we open the schema to say we're using aggregate rating now, so we're not using movie, we've changed to a different schema. The rating value, that, that's what it's actually got at the moment, is 8. The best rating you could get ever is 10. The rating count is the number of people who've actually rated that article, that, or that page, or that story. And then here is the number of people who've written a review. And there is a whole other schema where you can mark up the reviews that have been received and the person who's written the review and so forth. I didn't have enough space on the slide to go into all of that. So, so is that, does that make sense to everyone? Yeah? yeah? Great. So here's what could happen. I'm not saying it will happen on all pages. It does sometimes take a little t bit of time for it to come through. So we've got the star rating, which is giving us the average, the aggregate rating and the number of votes and the rating. We've got directed by and starring, so it's giving more information about the people who are in that um, movie. Then we've got another one here which is doing a different type of rating, so that's giving a percentage with uh, the number of reviews, and again it's got the information about the people who star. And this bit here is the description, so just the, uh, the little bit there. Now the, other, the new ish feature, you may or you may not have seen this in place, is the knowledge graph on Google. Has anyone seen that before? <laughs> on the right side. You don't always get it. Um, but where there is information, it tends to pull from reputable sources, I use in inverted commas. So Wikipedia, and there are a couple of other databases that it pulls from. So if it sees the information in here, that it can connect up with information in those reputable sources, it will show that on the right-hand side. So it's useful if you're searching about Pirates of the Caribbean because you want to find information about Johnny Depp, then it gives you a link here straight to information about Johnny Depp. And that's also recently been in improved uh, with the addition of information from Google, uh, Google Plus and books from Amazon and so forth. So it's pretty cool. And if you can get that happening for your clients, then that's really great. Yeah, I was wondering, because normally Google shows uh, the meta description as well. It, did you replace that by using, uh, adding a description? In another it doesn't way? always use the meta description. Yeah. If it finds content in the, in the web page, which is more relevant for the query that the person has searched for, then it replaces that. If you use this, then it, it, sometimes it will use that as the meta description. So, yeah. Right. To be honest, it's better to explicitly say I want you to use this on search engines, I want you to use this when you share it to, to social networks, than to hope that it picks up something relevant. Does that make sense? Yeah? So, the, the most um, beneficial thing if you're trying to build up the reputation of a brand or a person, which a lot of the time we are, um, is authorship and publisher microdata. Now authorship was set up to allow Google to find out who the genuine author of this piece of information is and have a way of having like a um, double opt-in type thing. 
So um, let's have a look at my article on the Joomla Community Magazine. So uh, this is an article I wrote in September about why you should be paying attention to Google+. Read it if you haven't read it, because it's useful and relevant to this. Um, and you can see at the top, I've got uh, my name, and that links to my author profile on the Joomla Community Magazine. On that, I have a Google Plus link, which goes to my profile. So that's a one-way link, a link to my profile. So when Google looks at this page, it's, it realizes that there's somebody on Google Plus who's saying that they're an author of this page. That's great, but anybody could say they were an author of a page. Anyone could write an article on their website and say that I was the author of it. So what Google has done is said that there needs to be a two-way link. So you need to say on your website that I'm the author of this, but on your Google Plus profile, you must have that website in your Contributes To section. So you need to say, I write on that website. So that's kind of like a loop, a feedback loop almost. And what that allows them to do is to say with pretty much certainty, that's the author of this information. And what happens when that happens, when that works, is that in the search listings, when this article comes up in the search listings, you see the picture of the person which is pulled from your Google Plus profile. And you see the information. So when you click on Ruth Cheesley, it gives you all the articles I've written. So if you find something by somebody that you like, you can view all the articles. And again, it tells you what, how many Google Plus circles they're in. Facebook doesn't do that. Twitter doesn't do that. LinkedIn doesn't do that. So the only way you can get your images appearing there is to have a Google Plus profile. So that's why I say read this article. <laughs> so it's becoming very important if you are a person of authority in a subject, you know a lot about a subject. It's becoming very important if you're a public facing person. But it's also becoming important for businesses to make sure that the people behind the business are being represented. So the, pe the, the people who know stuff are being represented in search listings. So any blogs you write on your website should have this authorship markup because then it connects back to you. So if you write on the community magazine, you write on your personal blog, you write on your company blog, you write here, there and everywhere, if all of those are connected to you, you can see that it starts to build a reputation. People start to see that it's you, the same you, writing in all of those places and they start to get fed up of your picture appearing everywhere. So why bother? Ultimately, it comes down to brand. It comes down to whether people trust the information that they're reading. It, it became really difficult, probably about five years ago, to find reputable information on Google search. So many people were writing such crap quality articles that when you're reading something, you don't know if it's actually true or if it's just somebody positing an idea or if they even have a clue about it. It might be somebody in the deepest, darkest Antarctica writing about something that they know nothing about. Google Plus and the authorship thing allows you to build an idea of what somebody knows about a subject and what their um, contacts think they know about a subject by adding them into their circles. So it's a really powerful way of leveraging getting yourself known, getting your clients known, encouraging them to put themselves out there, in effect. It's not for everyone. Some businesses don't like some people don't like to be the person that's seen. If that's the case, someone in your business needs to be. Somebody needs to become that spokesperson who knows about whatever it is that you do. One of our clients wants to be known as the go-to person for concrete, and he's not very pretty. So his daughter does all the blogging, and she becomes the go-to person for concrete. So, feel like this? I know a lot of people who are on Google+, and they have no idea what they're doing. They don't really know why they're there. They've got a profile, but they're not using it. You need to learn how to use it. Trust me, take a couple of hours, do a course, find out how to use it. It is really important, and it is making differences in search listings. So if you want people to find you, you want to make that money, you want to become reputable, you need to understand how to use Google+. So might be a bit of homework, sorry about that. So Google Plus profile is where it starts, and this is the important part. You now have this ridiculously huge space at the top of your profile. That's just a photo of a lock in Scotland, but you can put whatever you want. 
Um, but the important thing is that a Google Plus profile is about a person. It's not about a company. So when you make a profile, it needs to be about you. So you, your picture, ideally. And try and make it a picture that is clearly identifiable as you, so that when people see you at Jab, they're like, oh, I know you from somewhere. Or they know your name because they follow you on Google+. And maybe use the same photo across all social networks so that it's easy to remember who's who. Um, the tagline in the information bit is indexed by Google and is used when people see a snapshot of your Google Plus profile. So those bits are really important that you optimize and you get in what you actually do in the taglines. And then you have um, these tags across the top about posts, photos, YouTube plus ones, and so forth. And then you can give information about your work, what you do, who you work for. But that's where all of this authorship starts. To add your authorship microdata, on your articles, so on your blogs, you just need to add this snippet. So you, when you've got your profile, you get your profile URL, which if you hover over profile in your Google Plus profile, it tells you the URL. So you can right click and copy the link. And you just add on question mark rel equals author. So on the page, maybe you have Ruth Cheesley, and then in brackets, follow on Google Plus, or Ruth Cheesley, and then a little Google Plus icon. But the important bit is the rel equals author. That's the bit that you really need to have. Then you need that um, two-way link. So in the section that says contributes to, you add a link to your website. It can either be to the main route of your website or to your author's bio page on that website. Whichever, it doesn't matter, as long as it's got the domain on there. So here you can see some of the ones that I contribute to. You can also say if you're a current or a past contributor. At the moment, that doesn't do anything. But obviously, it's helpful to know if you don't write there anymore. Because anything that comes up in the future, Google's going to be like, well, they say they don't write there anymore. And that, released, that came out like three weeks later. Um, but it's not being used now. That's what I anticipate it being used for. But at the moment, it's not being used. So you can just say, I don't write there anymore, which is what I've done with the Academy, because that doesn't exist anymore. It's now called Sunsu. There's another thing that you can do as well, which is um, you can add publisher microdata. So if you have a Google Plus page for your company, which is fine, you can, ha you can add this um, code. So maybe somewhere on your website you have your social icons, follow me on Twitter, follow me on Facebook, follow me on Google+. If you have uh, rel equals publisher at the end, then all of your content on your site will be marked as that company being the publisher. At the moment, this isn't being used, but I anticipate that it will start to be used so that they can figure out which companies are reputable and knowledgeable in particular topics. So you can see how that would also be beneficial to, to you, possibly, and also to your clients. And you have to verify your website um, when you add it onto your Google Plus page. So when it's verified, it basically goes and checks for this code at the top. And if it finds that code linking to the same page, then you get this little tick that appears here. And that means that this, is, this has been verified. So that markup is on that website. So again, it's like a two-way thing. I wonder if I'm standing too far away because the clicks aren't working so well. So here's some uh, profile linking in action. You can see some of the listings from if you search for my name. And here is the link on my contributes to section. So you can see that it's adding in my profile picture, my information from Google Plus, and so forth. And they're all listed in my contributes to section of my website, of my Google Plus profile. The other nice thing that happens is if you have a Google Plus profile, if somebody searches for you, then you get a little knowledge graph. Now, I'm not famous, so I just get my Google Plus information. If you are famous, uh, I don't know if you guys know Guy Kawasaki. He's a pretty cool guy, and he knows a lot about Google Plus. Um, this information comes from uh, his profile, but also comes from Wikipedia. Uh, this is his recent, most recent Google Plus post. These are the books he's written. And the interesting bit is people who search for Guy Kawasaki also search for these guys. So you might also be interested in these guys. So that, again, this is using semantic information, and it's matching up what people search for with who, what people do. So this is what happens if you click on one of them. So if I click on Robert Scoble, it puts this nice black 
bit at the top with all the people who are relevant to the search that I originally searched for, Guy Kawasaki, gives Robert's information here on the side and information about him in the search listings. So it's much more becoming like based on what you do, what other people do who are like you and so forth. So why is it relevant to business? Well, ultimately, people are, um, if you give contextual information, you're more likely to give people the right information that they're asking for. But also, this can be used to uh, connect up social signals with your search results. Because Google Plus is a social network that is owned by the company who have the biggest search engine in the world. But it's not only a social network, it goes across all of their platforms. YouTube, Drive, Calendar, Gmail, everything. Google Plus is embedded into everything. So what's quite cool that's happening in America at the moment, and it will start happening here, is that when you search for something, if somebody in your Google Plus circles has recommended that page, you see underneath the name of the people who've recommended that page. So if I'm searching for something on Joomla, and I see that these guys have recommended it, and I haven't, I'm thinking, oh, God, I missed something here. Like people that I know are, uh, are knowledgeable about Joomla have liked that page and I haven't. So there must be something going on. If you think about this from a business perspective, if I'm going to buy a car, I'll be like, wow, I want something that looks really pretty and it's really nice and it's a cool color. Um, if I go to the car showroom, they'll try and sell me the most expensive, the most impractical car. If I speak to my friends, people in my network, they're going to give me trusted recommendations. They're not interested in selling me a car. They're giving me their experiences. And some people who know me will say, you won't fit your goalkeeper's kit in the boot of that car. So that's a really stupid idea. So this is giving you trusted information, trusted recommendations, because you've added them to your circles. So you know them somehow. You've got some kind of relationship with them. So really, really important. If you imagine from your business's perspective, if your clients are recommending your site and their friends are in their circles and they search for it, they see that their friends have recommended it. Which one would you go for? Something that your friend has recommended it or something that a salesman is trying to sell you? So this is how that's happening in search. And it's all being done with Google+, with microdata, with semantic information. So it's pretty cool. It gets me quite excited, <laughs> as you may have noticed and pink handbags, well I just had to put that one in. So why is this relevant to Joomla? All of these things could benefit from adding microdata, all of them, and probably loads more, but these are some of the ones that we came up with. And at the moment, there's no microdata. There's no contextual information out of the box. Some extensions are picking up on this really quickly. So EasyBlog has got um, authorship enabled, and it's got some microdata but many extensions haven't even started. Zoo has got uh, microdata for the ratings element, but that's it. So all of these could use microdata. Hey, you can add it yourself, go for it. Personally, that's a pain in the neck. I've done it for like 50 sites, I, don't, I get really fed up of it. Um, but it's really important, so it's not something that we can ignore. The other thing you can do is we've made a plugin that we're releasing today. Woohoo! Um, which is schema independent, because the other thing that a lot of people say to me is, well, yeah, I heard about schema.org, but what about RDFA, and what about this, and what about the other? If you hard code everything with schema.org markup, the disadvantage of that is when, if Google says we're not listening for schema anymore, we want RDFA light, and you've hard coded schema, you're going to have to redo everything. With this plugin, you say in the plugin which schema you're using, and then you put the... the uh, schema independent information into your content and then if you change in the plugin to a different schema it automatically puts the information in. So at the moment we've only got schema.org supported but we've got about 90%. The ones like volcanoes we haven't quite got that in. We didn't think there were that many people who needed to describe volcanoes. Uh, but we're in the process of also adding support for RDFA Lite. And so this is what happens in the search snippets. You add a uh, curly brace microdata colon name and then when the plugin picks that up it puts the information into microdata format. Um, for the geeks in you it does it on after render so you can use those curly braces within your template or within your components and it will put the information in when it goes through. Um, so that's just about to be released. 
Oh, it's on the website now. But The other thing that you can do is all the other information, like the authorship stuff and Open Graph, which is specific microdata for Facebook. We've, there's loads of plugins that we've got that do that. There's loads in the JED as well. We're not the only people doing it. But we've also provided core overrides for Joomla 3.1, which have got all the microdata in it. So all of the fields that could have microdata, it's already in it. So if you want to get them, just go to microdataforjoomla.com and you can get them for free. So save you having to do it the number of times we've had to do it. And there's a couple of other plugins, so you can have a look at those. Uh, if you use JAB13 as a discount code, then you can get 20% discount. Um, and we tweet about microdata stuff specifically for Joomla on at microdata Joomla. So if there's an extension that's starting to put microdata in, let us know and we'll tell everybody about it. Because ultimately, we just want people to start using microdata. We want best practice to start happening. So the other question which I throw out to people is, how could we get this actually into the core of Joomla? I don't know if it's possible or whether it's sensible to do that, because Joomla can be used for so many things that it's kind of difficult at the moment for me to figure out how that would work. But the potential's there. I think it, it's something that probably should happen, that there should be the ability for it to already be in Joomla and then extensions add it in themselves. But yeah, I'm not a developer, so the idea's there. So just a really quick review. or a really slow review. So microdata allows you to add context-based information into your web-based content. Search engines can then use that microdata to create rich snippets in your listings. Authorship and publisher markup is one particular type of microdata which lets you link up a person or a brand with a website or a page. And Joomla doesn't include this by default, but you can add it manually or you can use extensions to add the information in. So if you want any more information, schema.org is the place that, that's got all the schemas. Uh, Plus.google.com slash authorship is where you can get information about how to actually set up the authorship, how that works. Um, if you want a quick link to follow me on Google Plus, G plus.to slash Archeasley, or if you just search for my name, you should find it. So yeah, I'm pretty much done. I'll leave that slide up if you want to if you want to take a photo of it. So, are there any questions or anything that you want clarification on? Okay, maybe one, and then ask. <laughs> Right. Yep. Yep. So the question is, when you look at the way that uh, schema.org or uh, Google expects to receive the information, it expects to receive all the event data in one block. It doesn't. You you shouldn't start a block, stop, start a block, stop, start a block, stop. Um, the way to get around that can be through using meta, rather than um, rather than um, stopping and starting divs. Um, if it's possible to have one div that contains everything, that's one way of doing it. So you open the item scope here and you close the item scope here. That's another way of doing it. Um, yeah, other than that, it's, it's, it's difficult to actually get it all in one place. The, big, the, the place where you see this most is modules. Because, bec yeah, because you might have the main, yeah, you have the main content of your page, which might be an article. So you'd have the article markup, but then you've got an events module there giving latest events and then a ve um, location module there giving locations. That's always going to be a problem. What I would probably say is don't worry too much about putting the microdata in the modules. Put it on the page where you've got the information about the event um, and maybe the category page, which has got all the information about the events. And then no, don't worry too much about the modules because as long as that information is coming from the event page, those are the pages that Google's going to index, not the modules. Yeah. But if you've got bits and pieces all over the place, maybe c shuffle things around if you can. Yeah, it's, it's, it's sometimes you've got more and more source information on the page. 
Yeah. Yeah, but semantically you don't. So maybe CSS wizardry to move things around. Anyone else? Uh, the item scope information, like when you're declaring things, that's all in the in the English in the schema.org. Um, if you put the information into your templates, then it doesn't matter what language it's in; it's always going to be there. If you're using a multilingual system like um, Joomfish or FA Lang or Joomla Zone, <laughs> then you need to have that markup in the English version, in the French version, in the German version. You have to have the, yeah. So, and because each page is seen as a different page, it's not duplicate content. Then each page will be indexed, and each page will have that micro data. I believe I'm not sure, but I think there might be in the web page one something where you can say something about language, but I'm not sure. So. On the author link, you've got it so that all the different articles show up, but if you've got a blog also that, that has more short little tight things that go away, you know, six months now, it doesn't matter because you said I have an update on this, whatever, whether you have long articles. I'd rather have my long articles listed instead of the short little snippets. Are there ways on your site to say these should be included under my author link So the question, so just so I understand what you're saying, if you have a category blog view, is that what you mean with well, just the intro you text? Got, you've got some areas, you've got substantial articles that you would like to be indexed. In yeah. But then you've got maybe a blog talking about the product and the yeah. states or things that it's like it doesn't necessarily need to be up there yep. at the same level. Mm. So when somebody clicks on your authorship, mm. not having those small yeah. things that don't make, aren't relevant a month later, yeah. not to be mixed in with the yeah. Personally, I would say have all of them associated to you. Um, and depending on what the person searches for, Google will sort out what shows what's prominent and what's not. They might be searching for release date information, in which case they see the image and so they know it's from the same place. But if, you, if there are areas of your site that you don't want um, authorship, so there are some pages on my corporate website that I don't want to be assigned to a person because they're about the company. They're not, about, they're not written by or about a person. You just don't put the microdata in. You don't put the authorship information on that page. So, for example, if it's um, K2, then you would not show the author block for that page. Then it doesn't have a Google Plus link, and so it doesn't connect up the authorship. So you can proactively decide that, but you need to be able to do that within the template of your site or within the extension of your site. You need to have the ability to say, yes, show it, no, don't show it. So that depends on how you set up your site. Anyone else? Stun assignment? Yeah? It doesn't. We've got the K2 template overrides available on Microdata for Joomla because we've done it like so many times. <laughs> And it, but it does work very well with K2. If you put the information in, it does work very well. So, thank you. Anyone else? Did you have another question? Yeah. yeah. Um, so you have the film. So yeah. The film, the Depp, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. well, let's say you're just doing a local theatre production. Yeah. You've got your stars. You've got a separate page elsewhere on the website. Mm -hmm. With more information. Yeah. George. Yeah. Yeah. How is that like a unique identifier other than just does it match the name up from one page to another? What you would probably do is when you're opening the person schema, you can use all of the um, items from thing, which includes URL. Right. So you could say this is the person, this is their name, blah de blah, image, blah, and then the URL. So this right. is the URL about the person. About that person. Yeah. It should. You may not get a knowledge graph if they're not particularly famous. Um, if they are well known, then they can create a Wikipedia page, and then that will start to connect up the two people. Um, mm -hmm. Venues, uh, the venues, and company addresses, and things like that really add the information to your contact page. It makes a profound difference. You have that knowledge graph type thing, but for your venue. So you'd have photos at the top, and then you have all the information. You can declare the opening hours, the currencies you accept. It's really awesome. That's, uh, that's using the places 
schema and the subtype of postal address. And there's other things you can do about um, local office and things like that. If you've got a big corporate and they've got lots of smaller offices, you can have like the places one and then local office. And you can specify local offices and it does the same. And we had that with a client who did that. It took them an hour to add the microdata in for their place. And the next day, that information started showing business case for the whole company to implement microdata. Like that literally, just that one hour gave enough incentive for the business to say, yes, let's put microdata on the whole site. So that's a really good place to start. Anyone else? Yeah. A Google Plus profile is for people, not companies. A Google Plus page is for companies. And also, if you, you can have a Google Plus page and you can set up communities from that page. So, uh, for example, Joomla has the Joomla page and then you have the Joomla Google Plus community. But you could also have the Joomla Spanish-speaking community, the Joomla French-speaking community. So people land on your company page, then they can see related communities where they can interact with each other, they can search the community, they can ask questions. You can have categories within the community. And a super secret Google Plus tip, if you start using Google Plus a lot, I quite often use it in the middle of the night and I see something and I think, wow, that's really great, I'm too tired, I can't read it. If you set up a private community just for yourself, and then you share the information to that private community. It's like your own knowledge base. Top tip. Because there's so much awesome content on Google+, Plus that I can never expect to read it when I first see it. And I always think, oh, who was it who shared that? And if they're really popular on Google+, Plus, trying to find a post that they shared six weeks ago, it will take you like a week to find it. So if you share it to your own private community that nobody else has access to, you've got a repository of all the cool stuff that people have shared. So. Top tip. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah? yeah did I understand correctly? With this microdata for Yula, this extension, mm -hmm. it's real easy to add all kinds of microdata mm -hmm. in the uh, or just some of the uh, microdata? All of it. There's 10% of the schema markup that we haven't added yet. We're in the process of adding. And they're the really obscure ones that we've never seen used like um, volcanoes and medical devices and things. Um, at the moment, we don't have an editor plugin. We're working on that so that you can press the button and say this is a um, person, and then it inserts the person curly braces. So at the moment, you'd need to know the item property that you want to use. Um, but if you want some more information, come speak to me later. It's, it's more about microdata than my stuff. So talk to me later about that. Anyone else? Any questions? If you have a go, let me know what the effects are. If you implement this, tell me on Google Plus or Twitter and say, hey, this worked, or I'm not sure. Just, yeah, let me know because I'm happy to help if people are having a go. Sorry, one, one more. Have you um, talked about hidden content or duplicated content? Hidden content? Yeah. Yep, providing you're doing it for the right reasons, fine. And there are some, there, um, Google says it's fine to use meta, meta thingies, whatever they're called, metas, um, to hide content that you don't want your, your visitors to see, but only if it's for the purpose of providing microdata, not if you're trying to game the system. So it needs to be providing contextual information about the page. So examples where you might do that is ISBN numbers or... Yeah, or um, yeah, ISO dates, we use a meta to hide that. Um, but the other things is like if a product is on offer, you can tell the search engine when that offer finishes, so it can say only available for three more days, for example. You might not want your customers to see that. So you can have it in a meta so that it doesn't show. But you must, must, must not do that for anything, any purposes like getting better optimization. If you do that, yeah. If it sounds like it's wrong and it feels like it's wrong, don't do it. Same for ratings and reviews. Don't try and spam them. Don't try and get artificial ratings because you will get found out. So it's great to use, but don't abuse it. So, Okay, I think our time's nearly up. So if you have any more questions, do you want to speak to me afterwards? Or I'll be around real quick whilst we're packing up. Okay, I, I just don't want the next session to be okay. late. So thank you. Thank you.